welcome to the uh, July meeting of the uh, Committee on Open Government. Um, it's been a little while. We normally uh, meet in the fall and winter, so we're we're moving. In the last couple of years, we've had had a meeting at some point in the in the summer or late summer. So this is that meeting today. Um, just for the record, I'm I'm Shoshana Bule. I am the director, and I will will. Why don't we start with those of us joining us from separate public locations, introducing, and then we'll go around the table here. So in New York City, we have. Hi, I'm Dave Schultz. I'm a public member. Hi, good morning. I'm Soila Del Castillo, uh, Deputy Secretary of State for Economic Opportunity at the Department of State. And then um, we have uh, Franklin joining us from a separate location. Why don't you introduce yourself, please? I'm Stone. I'm uh, an appointee of the Assembly. And then around the table here in Albany, we have. I'm Ian McCallum. I'm the commissioner's designee from the Office of General Services. Uh, Stephen Waters from the Rome Sentinel, uh, appointee uh, from the Senate. Joe Lombardi, uh, designee of um, Robert Magna, budget director. And uh, with me uh, from uh, my staff today, we have uh, Candace Swanson <laughs> Cotto, Committee on Open Government. Kristen O'Neill, Committee on Open Government. And I'm here to introduce Ellie Baird, who is our intern here for the summer, a student intern from Hartwick College, um, working on a project for us that we'll talk about a little bit later in the agenda. So um, with that, um, if we could turn to the draft minutes that were circulated and have been posted uh, since last year on our website in draft, and um, see if anyone has had an opportunity to review those and would like to make a motion to uh, either discuss them or approve them or reject them. Nobody has a motion? Motion, <laughs> motion to approve. Yeah. Second. Okay. Um, is um, anyone against the approval of these minutes? Hearing no objection, uh, I think we can say that we have unanimously approved the November 30th, 2022 minutes. Thank you. Can I ask this time I'll hear me? Yes, please. Just a housekeeping question. Our two presenters, because I know it's not easy to sign on, uh, Kristen, I think you're our person to tell us. Are they on the phone? Are they having some difficulty? Do we know they're here? We've got it. It's all under control. Yep, they're here and they're not, no problems. Good. Okay. Um, Move forward. Um, I'll give a brief. I'll give a brief update. Um, since we last uh, spoke, I, I usually share some statistics with you. I'll share those now. Um, since we last spoke, official phone calls concerning our areas of remit have been 1,128. Um, since we spoke, our, our informal advisory opinions, questions, and answers have been 1,558. Um, the number of appeals that we have received from um, public bodies who are required to share those with us um, is 3,297. The number of virtual and live presentations that we have provided have been 34 within participants 4,905. Um, we have issued 21 formal advisory opinions and had uh, 23 FOIL requests for information to the committee. <coughs> that, and then Kristen has prepared some comments for you concerning um, hey, areas of interest from the legislature. Yes, sorry. Can you just clarify, you say since we last met, is that from last November or what, what's the time yes. period for these? November through the end of uh, June. Thanks. So David had asked, oh, I, 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 everyone can hear me, right? Yeah. I was like, I don't need to, not, do I? Uh, David had asked for maybe an update uh, regarding legislative proposals. There are, are at least 50 legislative proposals that uh, that relate to FOIL in, in some manner, or the open meetings law in some manner or the other. So I will not go over all of them because most of them are really have just been introduced and referred to committee, um, but haven't received a lot of traction. 
I thought I'd just mention a couple of the items that we included in the annual report from last year and let you know that they've been reintroduced. For example, there was a proposed amendment to uh, the Freedom of Information Law uh, relating to the repeal of Civil Rights Law Section 50A, which would have clarified an agency's, a law enforcement agency's responsibilities when a request for uh, personnel and disciplinary records are, are made. Uh, so that bill last year didn't really have, didn't move too much, and this year also it's been reintroduced and referred to committee, but hasn't gone beyond that. Uh, another proposal that we addressed in last year's annual report had to do with uh, amending FOIL to more strictly define periods for providing uh, records that also has been reintroduced and referred to committee. Uh, a couple of other bills relating to time limits have been referred to committee. Last year we noted that there's some ambiguity with relation to the definition of public body under the open meetings law. I was not under, able to locate any new proposals that would clarify that definition. So at this point, there, the current definition is what it is. Um, there was an amendment to require local governments to live stream their open meetings. That bill also has been reintroduced and referred to committee, uh, but no, no further action. And then real quickly, I'll just let you know, a couple of bills have passed the Senate and been passed in the Senate and have been uh, referred to um, have been referred to the Assembly, but have not passed in the Assembly. Um, one is a bill that would expand the definition of agency to include entities created by an agency or that are governed by a board of directors or similar body, which is designated by one or more state or local governments, sort of those quasi-governmental entities. Um, make, bringing them within um, the uh, coverage of FOIL. There is a proposal that has passed the Senate that relates to the applica applicability of open meetings and freedom of information law to certain not-for-profit corporations. Another bill relating to uh, the applicability of FOIL and the OML to not-for-profit corporations. A proposal that relates to the trade secret exemption requires entities that submit records to state agencies that are exempted from disclosure under the trade secret exception to periodically reapply for that exception. That also was reintroduced in the past the Senate. Uh, a bill to authorize and direct the Committee on Open Government to study proactive disclosure as a means of increasing transparency and access to government information has passed the Senate and delivered to the Assembly. Uh, a bill that provides for the award of reasonable attorney's fees in FOIL proceedings if the person is successful and in open meetings law proceedings to the successful petitioner against the public body also has passed the Senate. Thank you. So the, the next item that was up, uh, wait a minute, there was a... I have a question on the first uh, the, the statistics that you gave us. Thirty virtual online meetings. Were there no in person meetings in the last seven months? Five or virtual meetings were thirty four. I'm asking five or virtual in person meetings, if any were held in the last. Yes, seven. there were there were there were dozens. Yes. You don't have a number for that. I'm sure we do. It's not on my piece of paper, but we can look more deeply into the, Chris and we'll look it up and we'll tell you. Yeah, I think that's an important statistic to include in addition to the virtual and online meetings. We, sh it raises we, we, sure, we sure do include it in our annual report. Um, most people prefer virtual when they ask us to present. They, they, say, they say they prefer virtual, so we do what they ask. I, I hear you on that. My question was whether we had given up even proposing that, so... Apparently not. Okay. No, I'm sorry. What is your question? My, she wants my question whether was whether we had just given up even five. suggesting in person. Oh, of meetings. course not. No, we, of course we, not. We offer either, and what they request is what we then do. I have a ahead, question David. for I have a question for Kristen. That, that report was helpful, and um, I know the next agenda item is going to be about what should be in our report, but. 
I think that all the things that passed out of the Senate, we should at least talk about and have a comment on in our report this fall, because they got enough to pass that House. But the, the question I have for you, Kristen, is, is there anything, to your knowledge, anything in the legislature, uh, anyone in the legislature or committee, looking at the question of the use of algorithms, AI, or automated decision making by government entities, either as a FOIA issue or in any other capacity? I, we track the the, what, the the bills that relate to the freedom of information law. So if I had seen anything relating to the freedom of information law, it would have triggered something, which I'm not aware of. But other than that, yeah, I, if, I it think, doesn't, if it doesn't involve the freedom of information law, which it very well may not. Well, I think the I think, question is whether it, whether or not it should include the freedom of information law. So I think it's germane. Yeah, I mean the question. I just think for the for when we get together in the fall to talk about. Um, things and I know this is a future agenda item, the next agenda item too. So I don't want to jump too far ahead, but that it would be useful to find out what's going on in the legislature, even if it's unrelated. Because to me, this is like the issue of our times in terms of are we going to have government accountability? Because computer software and and big tech is taking over so many functions of government, and so many things government does are now being done by software that that is deemed to be a trade secret that it's an issue that we should be looking at. And within the last, this, with this, within this past year, just in the last few months, Connecticut adopted a, a new law that creates a whole separate system, sorry, a whole separate system for um, dealing with uh, approval of software, specifically as an accountability issue. Vermont has done the same thing. Many other states are looking at this. And I just think we owe it to the legislature since our, our mission is to you know, be focused on government accountability and transparency to get this on the legislative agenda. I don't, I don't know that we have to have a solution, but it seems to me we need to sensitize them to what's going on. So. And in fact, the, uh, uh, Senator Schumer has scheduled a, 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 a secret or a confidential meeting on that subject that all the senators will be uh, attending. Yeah. David, I'd be happy to reach out to um, counsel for the Senate and the Assembly and see if this is anywhere um, already percolating. Um, and certainly by so doing, <laughs> let them know that uh, it's something that we talked about a little bit in our previous annual report and are looking to um, talk to them more about and or provide whatever uh, ideas they may wish to rip off of. Yeah, so I think, okay. it, I think it would be a good use of, of your time um, to, to get a little educated and, and maybe what we should do in the fall is educate ourselves a bit about problems that exist in the state. I know that there's litigation going on now about the use of this Compass system, which is a proprietary software that is used to decide or to, to make decisions on who's eligible for, for parole and under what conditions. Uh, and there's litigation around that. Um, I know that there was a big brouhaha with the New York City schools about assignments to magnet schools. Uh, and, and I think, again, I'm not, I, I'm not up to speed on this, uh, Shoshana, but I think a few years ago there was a major effort in the New York City Council to come up with a system for dealing with this that, that failed, I mean, they, they, I, I think. And I think we should just try to educate ourselves uh, to provide that kind of a service to the legislature and the governor to put this on their radar and, and have some background information about who's been looking at it and, and what's been going on in the state. If they're going to be doing uh, a, a consideration of a predictive investigation on uh, whether it's, uh, it, it has to do with um, taxes or anything else like that, uh, knowing how the predictions work if it, it is, is certainly significant because it, and otherwise, it throws a shadow over over our understanding of, of government. Yeah, and, and I, I know that it's on the minds of, of some of our legislators because I had an informal conversation after our last annual report with my assemblywoman uh, Joanne Simon. She was not only familiar with it; she went on and on and on with examples from her own experience. So I don't know whether she is a leader or a follower in this area, but it certainly was very much on my assemblywoman's mind. So maybe they just need a nudge from us.
Okay, thank you. Does that segue nicely, uh, David, for you into a discussion, a further discussion of the, the subject matter? And you want to tee it off for us? Sure. Sure. I, I don't know that I have a lot more. I, I circulated some materials that mm -hmm. there is a great deal going on. I know that they are looking at this in Congress as well. Uh, the Canadian model has been adopted by some states. But, you know, as I understand it, and again, I'm not an expert. I've just done some work in this area over the last year. But there's kind of at least maybe two or three different approaches that that different governments are taking. One is um, is sort of the model of, of what we do in the environmental arena, which basically says to agencies, if you are going to purchase software or purchase automated decision-making systems, you need to do some sort of an impact statement, analyze it, be sure it's functioning effectively. You know, there's various criteria. That's, that's one approach, kind of an impact statement. Another approach, which is what they adopted in Vermont and Connecticut, is to actually set up a separate state body. You know, the idea is this requires some expertise, um, and it's sort of like um, uh, an approval process. I don't know if there's similar things that are done in, in um, procurement today in New York. I don't know how the procurement process works. There, there you, certainly is. <laughs> that you create a yeah, you create a, a system where people are appointed and have expertise, and they have to sign off on the acquisition of this. Again, there's a, there's a number of different questions. One is you know, just how much does the public know about how it works? Like, for example, this parole thing, um, they, they won't tell you what factors go into it, how they're weighted, what they're doing. It's just a black box. You know, if you're you're up for parole, they give the parole board, you're either rated, I, I can't remember, it's like an A, B, or C tier uh, in terms of what they think is your your risk of, of doing bad things again. And, and it's it's... There's all sorts of questions to raise there from a due process standpoint and others. But there's also, so, so one question is just what do we know? Another question is how do we know that it's working properly, even if we know the inputs? And there have been a lot of studies, particularly in um, uh, employment-related software, that the way AI gets trained is like looking at past decisions. You know, if, you, if you're trying to create a software to screen applicants for job pools, they, you know, they'll set up... Um, uh, a, a process where the this computer will search through all the resumes of people you hired in the last 40 years, compare them to how they did on the job, and try to figure out what factors are most relevant to uh, to succeeding at the job you're trying to fill. And what they found is the problem with that is if there's been systemic bias in past hires, that just gets built into the software. So the software discriminates in ways that are just like, uh, you know, past discrimination. So, so there's a, a discrimination and bias issue that also has to be addressed. Um, and like I said, I, I, I don't purport to be an expert in any of this, but what I am concerned about is I think that this is a major issue. Um, and I think we talked briefly last time, you know, one of the concerns is that software can do great things. It can save time, it can save money. But most government organizations, particularly at a local level or a county level, don't have the expertise to build their own software. I suspect even at the state level, and Shoshana probably knows more about this from her past job, but that what you do is you go out and you contract with a, a tech company that's done this before. And, and that it has two effects. One is it, 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 in many instances, can alter the way government's doing business because you start conforming to what their software will do in terms of what you think is important and how you do things. Um, and the other is they are the proprietors of that. So it's how it works and how it functions is no longer um, subject to transparency the way things have been in the past. And those are just the kind of the fundamental questions of, of looking at what's going on and how government functions and where we're headed in terms of ensuring that we will have public available, publicly available information sufficient for uh, effective democratic oversight. That's, that's really the key. David, you make some excellent points. And one thing that I wanted to sort of reiterate, based on my past experience with the technology agency and across the table for me is Joel Lombardi, who also has similar uh, experience on that very specific procurement legal team when we were both working at ITS together. Um, and that is, there are safeguards in place such that there are people approving the pieces of software that are being procured. But I do understand that to the extent that the factors that go into automated decision-making, they're human factors that are now built into and learning from 
past human experience and now becoming automated, somebody along the line reviews those, those data and decides whether it's an appropriate, whether it meets whatever benchmarks or targets as far as the software is concerned, whether security is proper, whether it is evaluating from a subject matter perspective the correct factors, whether it will feed, whether we can feed that algorithm the appropriate amounts of data for it to make those future decisions. So to the extent that, assuming that we can get beyond the, is that a secret, what those factors are and how we feed it and how it functions and what its recall is, is it on R1, is it on R2, what, what those, those specific functions are, the, the problem that relates will still be one of potentially the human experience, historical human experience, creating some of the same problems for the, for the future robotic experience that the prior human experience created for applicants, for parolees, for any of for prisoners. So ultimately, even if all of this stuff were completely transparent, the real problem that you're describing is something that for sure the legislature should be interested in, for sure the human for the citizens should be interested in, but it'll be, and we can for sure identify it, but even in a perfect world where all the inputs are known, we're not going to be able to correct for historical discrimination, feeding, future, you know, we're going to have to, that's somebody else's issue to deal with as far as from the subject matter perspective. So I agree with what you're saying that our human experience is potentially creating an AI experience that will be, that's based on it, and it probably has some of the same problems that we've created as humans, but I don't know whether FOIL can correct it. We can certainly use FOIL potentially to expose that, that, that these are the factors that are being considered. But again, to the same extent that we in the past had human factors that were known, like FOIL can, to the same extent we can expose what the human factors are, they'll be the same potentially factors that the algorithm is being fed. So it's a challenge to know which statute we need to attack. But you know, if awareness is where we're going and where it's at for this group, um, there may be ways to explain it that expose the sort of sordid problem that needs to be resolved. And maybe it's a human rights problem, maybe it's a discrimination problem, maybe it's a constitutional problem. Um, and if, if, if the role here is potentially to expose that, I think we can potentially do that. Um, I don't know how much correction we can do. We might be able to do some exposure. Yeah, and, and I think that those are all really good points, Shijan, and I guess I, I would just tweak, tweak your comments a little and say it's all those things, but it's also a government accountability problem, and that's, our, that's what's in our bailiwick, and, and it's a foil. The way I even got into this as an issue was in, in litigating under Freedom of Information Act and Freedom of Information Law criteria, trying to get information about, trying to just understand how some of these things work, and the basic problem with the law is the trade secret exemption, that, that this stuff is legitimately a trade secret in, in sort of a common law, ordinary meaning. Um, and, and so as long as we're going to say we protect trade secrets, and I'm not advocating that we should get rid of the trade secret exemption, you know, no one will do business with the state. But as long as that's there, then there's this problem. And so I'm not suggesting that it's an amendment to FOIA necessarily, but I think it's in our bailiwick to say FOIA doesn't address this problem. This is a government accountability problem that you should be looking at and figure it out legislature or you know we could help we could develop some information I, I do think it would be useful for our report to come up with some very concrete examples of issues around the state because I know they're out there where people have, have have complained or have been unable to get information that's really critical to things like you know how services are allocated or you know who gets the benefits of various programs to, to, to raise the awareness that this is something worth looking at. Sure. Uh, you know, again, trade secrets, I think potentially one of the issues is not necessarily to fix the trade secret exemption, but ensure that it is being properly understood. Uh, because I think there's a difference between the factual data and the mechanics of how an algorithm is built and, and executed. We can have access to the facts if it's, you know, and I think that there's some blanket being. I, yeah, I'm with you completely, and I can tell you though there are there's cases out there where the people who own these algorithms say, if I tell you the factors and the weights, I've given away the economic value of my algorithm. 
For so, sure. So. But I think that's that's one argument. I, that's yeah. one argument, and this courts have to see it in a particular way in order to, right. you know, so, so, to understand it. Yeah, so well, that would be I'll sit on the yeah. other side. I'll sit on the other side and say the the algorithm and an algorithm as such that, that that evaluates weights ought not to be proprietary. Well, that's pretty valuable. <laughs> that's a pretty loaded statement. I don't know for sure. No, I'm not looking for an answer. <laughs> But I'm saying that just because you say it's proprietary doesn't mean it necessarily is. Right. Well, then that's a decision for a judge, I think, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Well, that's, that's, no, no. that's a whole bigger question about open source software versus, you know, sure. we're, yeah. we're never going to solve. So, yeah. Can't legislate humility either. No. <laughs> Certainly not. Oh. We'd be busy. <laughs> Does anyone have anything else to add um, about this this topic at the moment? Okay, no. Well, I guess just I guess maybe we could just oh, like so, no, I don't have more to say. But 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 if we're going to move on, maybe we could just kind of can we summarize kind of where we are or what the next steps are going to be towards moving towards our report? Are we going to try to collect data? Are we going to see what I mean? We talked about maybe seeing what's going on in the legislature. Is there a way uh, to to try to um, survey what's happening in this area around the state? Is that a useful, do we have the capacity to do some of these things? How, how, where, how do we move from here to a report? So we, we, you know, the only thing that I can think of, we, we certainly, I wouldn't know who to call, right? But as far as getting those, those um, factual scenarios to highlight. However, um, I think that some of the people who are listening might have heard, um, of some of these examples and could potentially give us this information. Another thing to think about is, you know, certainly having spoken about it on this call, on this meeting, um, it's pretty clear that we're looking for examples to, to think about and talk about. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I, I committed, I'll call out, I'll reach out to council for both chambers and see if they're hearing from their constituents um, any examples that are worth noting um, and you know and I but I think that anyone who has an idea of who to speak to or how to um, find these examples should should do that um, I'm afraid that I can't call general counsels of agencies and say tell me your worst nightmares you know and and I'll highlight them in my annual report that's not going to work so um, but uh, I, I think that, that this, as it's known that we are looking, things might find us. Um, and uh, systematically, the process of, of engaging another person to do some reaching, some outreach is, is, you know, it's possible, but it takes time and probably can't be accomplished before our annual report. Uh, and then figuring out who to speak to is another, you know, I mean, advocacy groups potentially for, you know, prisoners for benefits recipients might be sort of rich areas. And if anyone has contacts among those organizations, probably worthwhile to tap into them so that we, they can bring us these anecdotal pieces of information so that we can, you know, investigate, you know, their bona fides and, and talk about them in the report. Other ideas about how to go about collecting that information? I, I do have a few leads I could give you, particularly if you have a, a, a bright young law student with a little time. Um, <laughs> there's, 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 we don't. Know there's a, we, do, we, we have, not. We have we a have bright young student, student but we but uh, we are devoted her time to something specific, which I will talk about next once we're through speaking okay. about. Anyway, I, what I was going to say is I, I I have some leads I could probably pass on to you. Um, sure, send them along, a, and we'll a, we'll see yeah. if we can um, you know incorporate following those up and or figuring out someone who can. I think Franklin, uh, Franklin's trying to say something. I think you're on mute, Franklin. Yeah. Kristen's going to look and see if, if she can see if you're on mute. There we go. She, she just um, muted. And I'll, I'll ask my assemblywoman because she had several examples uh, okay. you know, at, at a party. So I, I think I think if we ask around, we'll find people um, who have examples. I 
disagree with that. I think that they'll be, they'll, and if it's known that we're looking, that some of them might find us. So, um, okay. Um, the next thing that's on this agenda is is our obligation as the as 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 a committee to provide a sort of special report to the governor and the legislature concerning how it's going with um, Section 103A of the Open Meetings Law, which is the extraordinary circumstances video conferencing provisions that were the compromise result of um, the budget making and that uh, in certain limited circumstances has expanded the use of remote access platforms to do meetings where the or a member of a public body can't be physically present with the rest of the members of the public body due to an extraordinary circumstance. Um, so we knew that we hear from bodies, a lot of bodies that um, don't like this, that have complaints about it. Um, we, we hear from, from bodies that are used to contacting us, that feel free to contact us, that know we exist, um, that have a, a, a standard relationship with us, lots of questions coming. What we wanted to make sure that we received is feedback broadly, um, less specific, less self-selecting. We wanted to go out and do some more um, broad uh, surveying amongst public bodies in the state, uh, categorically, you know, municipalities, school boards, fire districts, local government, other, other local government bodies, planning boards, um, state bodies, just a broader selection of types of bodies subject to these requirements. And so we thought the a one way to approach that was to get someone who was a smart student who had the summer um, who could devote hours to doing it. So we conducted a recruitment and we landed on Ellie Baird from Hartwick, who is um, together with um, me and my staff come up with a comprehensive questionnaire that we go through that Ellie will call and or email or otherwise contact and collect data from these public bodies. And we're going to then keep that data, synthesize it, you know, shake it around, and then we'll come back at the time that we're providing drafts of our annual report, we'll provide the findings that Ellie has been able to get over these hours during the summer of collection. So um, that is why we have Ellie with us and hopefully she likes what she's doing and will be willing to come back next summer and do whatever next project we have. Um, and uh, so as she goes through this and continues to collect data and make, you know, speak with more and more public bodies, we will be building our database um, with which we can then inform the legislature and the governor um, of what the experience has been and where, where changes might be useful. So that's my spiel, and we can now otherwise speak about anything you're hearing about um, public body experience with this or any other questions or comments on that topic. Um, I think this sounds great, but don't we also want to solicit uh, the opinions of, um, of people on the other side, like uh, public interest groups, media? Uh, the, the, we are. The the people that form part of the debate that resulted in the compromise? Yes, we, we those are on the list as well. Okay. You just oh, kept saying you public see? bodies, public bodies, and I want to make sure we cover both sides of the of the issue. We are. Thank you for pointing that out. Could, could you say a little more about how you selected who you're going to look at? Like, obviously, you can't talk to every agency around the state. So how, how did you come up with the universe of what you're going to look at by size or by geography or is it just random? What, what do we, how did you do it? I started with what I do, when I've done my programs, my presentations, I let people know that if they're, if they were interested in participating in the survey, please reach out to us. And then I've just, you know, over the years, I've you know, developed lists of contacts, uh, including association, good government groups. So I've sent out notifications to those groups, asking them to also share, you know, sending it to those groups, but also asking them to share with it, uh, either members of their organizations um, as they see fit and asking them to, to, uh, to reach out to us and let us know if they're interested in participating in the survey. Reached out to media as well. Media. Did we, um, 
when you're getting um, complaints about open meetings violations, which I assume among these, I don't know if you gave a specific number for those, but I assume you right. get those. Do you, yes. do you ever tar target any of those uh, where the complaints come from to do a survey and see? You know what I mean? If someone complains, then go back to we, the body. Those, yeah. We've added that information to our, you know, the pros and the, 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 the viewpoints expressed mm -hmm. by those have been included in our data. Um, so um, we hear routinely from, sometimes we'll hear from the same person four or five, six times a year, sometimes four or five, six times a month with various complaints about their town. So not only do we include those pieces of information in our ultimate calculus for this is, these are the complaints about, especially if they deal with remote 103A issues, um, but then we would then, of course, speak to that town or those bodies affected to figure out what they're doing and if they're doing something that can be modified to make it less likely that we're going to receive the next call. We certainly try to do that. Um, but the point of, of doing research in this way, because we, do, we don't really have the staff to sit around and dial every single town in the state. Right. That's the idea. We were trying to, you know, we could get a, a flotilla of, of talented students to do that. But um, we decided that we would, instead of going back to the legislature with a pretty anecdotal self-selected group, that we would do what we could by way of diligence to collect as much data as we could from as many kinds of groups and individuals as we could to see if we could get a truer picture. Um, and not everyone that Ellie has contacted has even thought about this issue. So that's another piece of information that's relevant is that some people have, because they've not thought about the issue, they're still doing it the way they, they became used to doing it during the pandemic, not realizing that things had changed and that other obligations had superimposed themselves. So that's also opportunity for education because I think that Ellie then says, well, perhaps you didn't know, but <laughs> you're doing it wrong. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting the word out in that way, but I think it's information that the, that will be interesting to everyone involved to hear that some number of public bodies were unaware that this was a requirement, and um, so perhaps there's more to be done to ensure that that public bodies in general are getting the instructions that they need from their their responsible organizations like counties or towns or even state agencies, but I don't think there's a state agency that's not aware of this issue, but certainly there might be a fire district that's not aware of it. The, uh, the basic question is how do the rules make attendance more difficult than it needs to be? And um, I'm, of course, the prime example of that. And as I mentioned before this meeting, I'd be just as happy if all of the members of this group uh, after this meeting, drove down to Kingston and came back before going to the office to give some indication of um, the penalty I have to pay in order to attend this meeting. And then at the next meeting, you can drive to Kingston and back before the meeting, and then go back to Kingston and back after the meeting. Um, and that's just a question of the rules. That's not a question of a survey. It's a question of why is this rule the way that it is? And so I would add that to the, uh, to the hopper of, of what should the rules be and why. And there was actually the, the point that you're making was, was uh, a point that was made in the 2021, was it, 20, oh, was it October of 2021 where they had the hearing? I believe it was, yeah. um, where the, the, it seems the time has been compressed in some way. The legislature held a special hearing on remote on remote attendance, and this was a piece of feedback that they received over and over again, is that there seems to be some kind of a penalty mm -hmm. to participate in, um, to participation where you have to be physically present and you live a long way from the hub. Yeah. The hub. The hubs. The hubs. New York City. Yes, Buffalo. you can pick your hub, right? You're just, mm -hmm. We're just happened to be the lucky closest hub <laughs> for you. Um, right. The, the central New York penalty is that right. you're paying. Um, so this this was uh, a, a topic, and I, I believe is captured in, Thank in you. the survey that we're doing. Um, I, 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 to pick up on your point of 
of smaller entities not even knowing what the rules are or knowing what they are and not complying. I think that's something that one of our good government groups raised, so it's likely to come up again um, in our in our meeting. But it does seem to me that, that uh, to the extent that we have facts we can comment on that we might want to address in our annual report the failure of um, local entities to follow the open meetings law, oil, the, 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 the legislation that, that we're concerned with. And this is another example you've just given from your own experience that people don't even know what the open meetings law requires. That's true. And, and you know, we will, that's why we included those pieces of the survey so that we could, we could have some kind of reportable kernel of data to make people aware of some of the shortfalling, the shortcomings of how it, how information gets percolated to some of these responsible entities, especially because the definition of the entities that are responsible is so broad. Um, some, sometimes the entity isn't even aware or questions, challenges that they're even covered um, by these laws. And we do see a lot of that. And that forms the basis of some of our opinions is we're commenting not to back to people to say, to say look, we've, we've looked at the facts that you presented to us and we believe that your body is covered by this law. So start acting like it, it you know, is the implicit message. Um, we, we can't deliver that message in the same way that um, a court can, but we can certainly say in our opinion, we think you should be complying with the, with the law because we believe that you're covered by it. Um, so. By hook or by crook, we will be raising the issue um, it, that, it, that comes up in the data. I think yeah, and I think the New York Co Coalition for Open Government gives some other examples. You can look behind, but they they seem to have some statistics in here of um, entities uh, failing to comply. And we'll get to it because I guess they're going to speak shortly. But the non-compliant, I mean, it's bad enough that... that it's bad enough that, that maybe the rules aren't strict enough, but, but if people aren't even bothering to follow the ones that we have, we've got a problem that we should flag as an entity. One of the things I think in advocacy that this committee has is not necessarily to point out what the rules are, but to point out why the rules are there. That, that it's, the, the Constitution may be important, but it's the reason behind the things that are in the Constitution that that matter and and open government is is really a, a question of do you have governance or do you have rule and and this is a country that was based upon governance not not rule and we want to remind people of that uh, time and time again and be sure that the procedures are there that uh, that assure that it's it's governance not rule and it gets back to political science, which was previously thought of the art of the possible, um, more realistically in studying what happened during the millennium and the hundred years before the millennium, I learned in our county that, that political science or politics was the art of, of what you could get away with. <laughs> and, and the real reason that we are here is because we want to make as, as small as possible that definition of, of politics. I think an important factor too in this is we, and we discussed this before during, you know, the pandemic was there, um, you know, the technology available to some people. And that causes a problem for follow through and why this hasn't continued. I know in my, my own county, our, Technology was terrible for people watching the movie and they watching the meeting and participating in it. And that's another that's another factor of how we go forward with what is acceptable and what isn't. What I works. Think they're doing a broadband study in conjunction with all of this. Yeah. There's been um, other other en entities have responsibilities to report on different aspects of that and technology. I think is one of them. So we don't have that responsibility. That's not our kind of remit here, but, but uh, there is, I think, some, some study going on to figure out if there's, um, if that's a barrier. Mm -hmm. Obviously, anecdotally, it's been a barrier to some, and, um, you know, hopefully the projects that are ongoing will open up some of that. But, um, 
again, it's another it's another aspect of this that is uh, a stump a potential mm -hmm. stumbling block for compliance. Or it limits on what, what we can do in the future. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any other topics that they want to introduce now as potential future topics, or um, shall we hear from our invited speakers to give us those, uh, to give us some prompting and ideas at the moment? I, I just have one point. I, I mentioned earlier that I think in our report this fall we should comment on the, those things that Kristen mentioned, like the proactive disclosure. The thing, let me put it this way: I, I think that when we, we do our reports, it would be good practice to include and have a comment on, a view on. Uh, any piece of legislation that is voted out of committee so that it's kind of a live issue. So I think when we get closer to fall, we should look at those. There are probably not going to be that many. It looks like there's maybe three or four now and include all of them in our report and have a position on it. I think that, thank you. I do. I think that that has been our practice also. So um, we will make sure that we are doing that as going forward as well. Do we want to begin with our with our invited speakers? Okay, sure. All right, John. Right now, I am going to make you a panelist because right now you are an attendee. I'm converting you to a panelist. So at this point, John, I also just unmuted you. Um, hopefully, if you'd like to, you can bring the camera if you'd like to, and hopefully, you should also be able to share. Okay. Please. Hello. Let me see if I can share this. I'm John Caney from reInvent Albany. Thank you for uh, having me. I have a short slide show, and let me see if it can possibly be shared here. Um, for you. It's good. We do have a view. Perfect. Yep. You see that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, anyway, reInvent Albany is a uh, uh, Watchdog Group, we've been around since 2010. We've done a lot of work with Coog. Um, transparency is one of our core areas of activity. We also work a great deal on government accountability, uh, corruption risk um, issues, ethics, and uh, voting, and also on um, public finance and um, transparency of public finance. So we are very applied in how we use uh, freedom of information law and open meetings law. Um, we use them ourselves all the time in our advocacy areas, and um, I think we have a pretty good understanding of their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, let's see here. We are um, we have a, a, a team of uh, five and lots and lots of consultants, including some of uh, the top FOIL litigators uh, in New York who we can call on, and um, we also have technologists uh, that we can uh, rely on for very specific uh, questions about uh, different technology uh, uh, matters. And um, to that end, we have been, uh, let's see here, um, uh, we have, pardon me, um, been working on a lot of specific transparency laws, policies, and programs. And uh, uh, just to underline that we look at laws as just being part of the um, the spectrum of uh, establishing how government works, and, and sometimes it's not even the most important. Um, the um, uh, the policies, programs, funding, and agency norms are uh, are are more important oftentimes than the law. Uh, we work in coalitions very very frequently, um, and um, lately this just gives you idea of some of the bigger things we've been working on. But um, we have. Uh, a, some success. I think we've passed six or seven laws changing FOIL over the last decade, all of which are not listed here. Um, we have been active in online transparency. Uh, we uh, were the main force in passing the law uh, strengthening attorney fees for those who prevail in uh, FOIL lawsuits, which we'll get to. And uh, we've worked a great deal with the governor's office and uh, agencies and city uh, city agencies and less so with localities, but um, these are all this shall be uh, shared and and you can look. These are all links, so you can look things up. We also do a lot of research. It's all on our websites. Um, we evaluate the governor's transparency plans. 
Um, we uh, have a big project on the MTA where we've uh, at worked with them on open data and also passing an MTA open data law and MTA FOIL. So they're one of our, our specialty uh, agencies we work with. They're the, the biggest government entity that the state runs. Um, and um, uh, generally just uh, very engaged in uh, trying to promote uh, open accountable government. We uh, do dozens of bill memos a year. Uh, here are some, these are all on our website. Um, so you can look at them and their status. Um, we uh, uh, advocate both with the houses of the legislature and with the governor's office uh, on transparency and other bills. And um, uh, we are all lobbyists and um, we uh, are very, very engaged in the policy formation and passage of legislation and the budget. Uh, here are some examples of transparency specific legislation that we support. Again, I don't need to read through them all because um, we will uh, share the slideshow so you all can look at it. But these are some of the things we have going. Um, what a couple of things I would underline uh, is uh, S3257, which ends the uh, commercial foil exemption. Uh, we think that's important and uh, should be picked up um, by uh, by Coop's annual report and repeated. Um, the uh, uh, Stack Lou uh, A5357 uh, uh, strengthens FOIL's attorney fees, um, and we'll get to that too. But we uh, we strongly agree with uh, other advocates that uh, that the substantially uh, the word substantially should be removed from the FOIL attorney fees uh, bill because it it complicates things and uh, makes it harder for the public to win their fees. Uh, we um. We've really identified six transparency principles that are very familiar to you all because this is the preamble to uh, the section on uh, FOIL from the uh, public officer's law. And um, those are that government's the public's business. Um, free society maintain what government is responsible, responsible to the public. Uh, and, um, and you know the rest. But uh, I... We, we broke those out for a reason, which is when we're looking at how agencies, public authorities at the state and local level work, this is really what we're evaluating them. Um, are they, uh, are they uh, striving to uh, fulfill, <coughs> to uh, be consistent with these six transparency principles, which are in state law? You could call this kind of the the official principles or, or transparency philosophy of New York right here. Um, and um, uh, the answer, unfortunately, most of the time is no, uh, that, uh, that overall uh, our experience and um, uh, which we've documented, and again, I'm not gonna go through all of our uh, analysis of FOIL logs or other data, which um, I understand that, that Paul uh, has a, some sampling too, but um, our, our experience, uh, both analytically and uh, subjectively, and from speaking to public stakeholders that are uh, super users or uh, of FOIL, open meetings law, open data, and generally uh, engaged with government, is that uh, that uh, despite all the great work, by the way, that the Coob staff does and and Coob does, and this is this is not you, but you are the Committee on Open Government. And um, and one of the reasons uh, that I'm here with you today is to ask that you uh, look higher and broader. And I think uh, consistent with what Schultz has been saying, uh, think of yourselves as the internal advocates and ombudsmen for transparency and accountability uh, overall. And um, so when you're looking at what goes in the report, we're hoping that you're looking at uh, big things, what's good, what's not so good, and um, also uh, specifics and bright spots. Um, specific things on that we would flag where there's a woeful lack of transparency um, include some things that are outside of your domain. For instance, lump sum appropriations to the legislature, um, huge corruption risk, obvious, obvious problem. Uh, the uh, Mega projects, uh, 
and I'm going to single out the state's uh, economic development authority here, um, is are, are just terrible about shrouding basic details about where public funds are being spent and public obligations. And they regularly abuse uh, the uh, commercial exception uh, and trade secrets exceptions in, um, in FOIL to uh, not give uh, information out. So we have we have an endless discussion about that, but um, I'll point right now to ongoing lawsuit uh, in New York City about the Penn Station development tornado project where uh, a very large community coalition has had to repeatedly uh, file Article 78 foils again, uh, uh, take uh, ESD to court on that one, um, and, and has won three rulings in a row, I think. So anyway, those are kind of high level things. Um, FOIL itself, we view as systematically dysfunctional. Uh, our, our experience is poor, uh, that, and many of these issues are extremely familiar to you um, and are, are raised in public forums, in newspaper editorials, and in uh, uh, endless discussions among uh, people who use FOIL a great deal, but uh, endless postponements by agencies giving themselves endless uh, you know, time to provide answers, uh, fragmentary responses uh, from agencies, common, common delays of eight months to a year under FOIL, um, and, um, and agencies uh, gaming FOIL requests by uh, just blatantly abusing exceptions or doing things like uh, uh, providing image files of sheet of page after page of tabular data. So it has to be scraped by the public to be uh, useful. It's, it's, it's a problem. And um, we'll get to this in, in a moment. Um, agencies just are overwhelmingly failing to use their websites in common sense ways to provide the public with FAQs about what they're doing and their priorities uh, or to uh, put their most foiled records online in ways that uh, reduce their FOIL burden and also help the public. So there's a vast amount of basic improvement that's needed by agencies uh, to just uh, begin to try to fulfill the spirit of the, uh, the law when it comes to open government and the legislative declaration. Uh, generally, state agencies are not complying with state uh, EO 95, the open data. Uh, EO, uh, though ITS has been doing a pretty great job, we, we got to say. So there needs to be a lot of help, and that's an area where we would like to see Coog uh, speak to and encourage uh, agency responsiveness. Um, to that end, too, uh, open data is not being used, despite the fact that in 2010, this is something in gov uh, incoming governor specifically identified uh, when Andrew Cuomo was coming in about using open data and uh, 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 just websites to reduce FOIL requests. And um, that's very rarely being done. It's still just an opportunity sitting there. And it's something that we would like Coog to continually emphasize, which is that uh, we, FOIL is, you know, is a massive burden on a lot of agencies. We get it. And there are some common sense ways to, to deal with that, which is get that information online. When you can. Um, and then lastly, uh, the, the, it, you know, it's disappointing, I'm sure, to all of us that uh, agencies treat transparency very, very often as a, a burden, an afterthought, an annoyance rather than a core service. Uh, they should be thinking of it as a core service. FOIL and OML and open data uh, expectations are never going away. So agencies need to fund that uh, service and uh, systemize it and create uh, processes that are efficient and um, and not uh, just kind of deal with it as a, oh yeah, and then we have to do this thing. Um, by the way, it's in their interest from a PR uh, perspective and just public confidence uh, perspective to that too, and I'm sure you folks totally agree. Um, and then lastly, agency understanding uh, and management and data collection about their transparency mandates and how they're responding is really, really poor. They're just simply poorly managed because the agencies are not looking at these mandates as, again, as a service. So they're not looking at it as a continuous improvement process. Uh, and uh, transparency as a service, FOIL as a service, 
uh, and the fact that they're, they're not just add-ons are things that we would like to see Coop emphasize. That, uh, that, that agencies, despite FOIL being in existence now for decades, uh, typically will underfund their FOIL operations, creating and then creating a cascade of, of failures uh, and uh, FOIL officers who are overwhelmed and, um, and quit. And um, we talk to FOIL officers and, you know, uh, we, we feel for them. They're, uh, they're doing a lot of work. Um, so it's, it's, you know, what can you do as a committee on open government? Um, again, you know, respect to you, uh, the COOP staff. Uh, uh, we're not uh, here dumping on the uh, systemic transparency problems that uh, afflict your government. What we can ask you, what we will, is that uh, that you'd be much more upfront about the breadth and severity of the problems and um, help with by providing what we think are, are realistic programmatic and budget solutions. So uh, asking for money or pointing out that funding issues do bedevil uh, many, many, many uh, local uh, government entities uh, that uh, simply cannot respond to FOIL requests or uh, cannot meet open meeting law mandates. That, that needs to be talked about uh, by Coop because where else? There is no one else that's going to talk about it. And um, the uh, uh, discussion in Coop often seems like an alternate reality to us from what we're having on the political level with the legislature, local governments, uh, and the governor's office. And, and we'd like you to uh, lead the discussion there. And part of leading the discussion is getting down to brass tacks about uh, you know, the uh, pervasive underfunding and um, uh, the fact that there are huge, huge problems between leader and laggard agencies. So there's just a massive management problem. And we understand historically Coop has been there as a legal helpline and legal advisor, which is massively valuable. Um, but uh, that, that does not help address the systemic problems, the delays, and the, um, the fact that there are a lot of just uh, profound issues with transparency uh, at every level of government that um, we're happy to enumerate uh, for hours and hours and hours, but that's probably not what we're gonna do right now. Uh, so what do we want you to do is um, uh, honest assessment of the, the transparency efforts that are underway and, um, and what is known uh, and what should be known. So have that wish list of uh, information, of data. Um, you know, how many FOIL requests are, are being filed, for instance, uh, un under FOIL? You know, what, how are they responded to? How many Article 78s? Uh, the, um, how long do FOIL requests take? Uh, we know that who can't do all of this. You're not funded to do all this, but just putting out a list of all of the data and things that you would want to be able to uh, create a more systematic uh, transparency regime in, in your uh, state and local government. Uh, putting those questions out there in order would be very, very helpful and would help advocates and the legislature and the governor's office get them funded. Because uh, we don't know collectively, uh, the people of New York, advocates, the government, what is going on uh, beyond uh, ad hoc studies that advocates uh, periodically do. Uh, nobody actually knows how many FOIL requests, for instance, are filed uh, in, in New York State or what the disposition is or exactly how long they take. Um, that's something that we kind of know at reInvent Albany because we've looked at, we FOIL FOIL logs and collate them. But, um, but I can tell you that the, the information uh, uh, black hole is, is just massive. And that's a big difference between New York and the federal government, for instance, which has detailed metrics on at least their FOIL and open data. Um, in the Coob report specifically, uh, you know, uh, we may not agree with you on everything, but uh, we do appreciate when you have a clear hierarchy of priorities, when you say this is what we think collectively or we have a consensus on is the most important thing. And, I, you know, uh, no offense to the legislature or to, to you, but it's just it's not super helpful to have long lists of uh, open government potential legislations that they just choose from a la carte. 
you know, we call it here traditional a la carte recommendations and because that's not a strategy. It's not additive and it doesn't show priorities uh, or a sense of what's really important, less important. And as a result, we get dozens and dozens of open government bills. Uh, as uh, Kristen at the beginning, I think she just was referring to FOIL and OML bills and, and identified 50 or 50 plus. And, um, and really of those, only one or two or three matter or, uh, in, a, in a structural way and actually have a chance to pass more importantly. So, uh, you know, again, we would strongly support you just having a clear hierarchy of priorities. Uh, you know, do this first legislature because uh, the transparency theater uh, that results from having uh, dozens and dozens of uh, legislative items introduced is, is just, uh, it subtracts from trying to get more transparency. It doesn't add to it. Um, other things in this annual report, uh, we'd like you to talk about yourself, and we think this is a whole separate meeting, but uh, we'd really like to see a, 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 a rewrite and examination of Coob's uh, mission role, capacity funding, perhaps independent governance, uh, because there's no doubt that uh, your mission is way too broad for your resources, uh, and, and again, uh, you know, thank you, Coop staff. I mean, we really, you guys are, are really impressive. The, the numbers that, uh, the 1,100 calls, uh, you know, 1,500 plus advisories, that's incredible stuff to do in um, one quarter since whatever, whatever the time uh, was since your last meeting, where it's very impressive, but they're just, uh, but Coop needs to be evaluated uh, for 2023 and the changes uh, since the, uh, 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 public officer's law that created it was was passed. It's a different, different world now. Um, FOIL, again, we mentioned just the, the absence of basic data uh, and, um, and uh, how much that hampers being able to improve things. Uh, we think that New York State collectively at all levels is, is well over 300K in uh, annual FOIL requests, which is just a massive, massive number. Um, and it's probably, it could be double that. If somebody said it was double that, I, it, you know, I, we'd have trouble disproving them. But, um, but it's a huge, huge number. And so volume and uh, how agencies are supposed to efficaciously deal with that volume is a big, big question because it relates to delays and, um, and just the efficacy of FOIL and uh, the fact that people have to go to court too often, which is expensive and available only to the uh, most uh, well-funded and uh, uh, interests. Um, also, uh, I, you know, identifying leader leaders in particular, if laggards are too politically sensitive, forget it, doesn't matter, but we would know there's a huge gap between leader agencies and laggard agencies. I mean, some agencies are doing okay. Um, and um, it, uh, it, it would be good to identify them uh, and why what they're doing that's okay. So I think we all know that uh, really big state entities with lots of resources uh, find it easier to uh, comply with FOIL and OML and uh, put it more information on their websites than do uh, small localities. Um, I mentioned county clerks here uh, specifically because we hear about county clerks all the time. Uh, and if indeed county clerks are in crisis and un unable to comply with FOIL, then perhaps there's something that the state can do to help them uh, specifically uh, and maybe some things that can be done uh, to, to identify critical uh, breaks in the transparency chain here. Uh, proactive disclosure, uh, th this is, the state needs basic expectations uh, and best practices uh, to be codified and uh, put into law. And this is a huge research area. Again, we would not uh, say this is something that Coog has to do, um, unlike the legislation, unless you want to, and you should tell us if you want to, because this is a ton of work here. Uh, but when it comes to proactive disclosure for specific Coog recommendations, uh, we recommend that you be as specific as possible, and we'll get to that in a second. And um, we hope you continue speaking to open data. We think it's part of uh, some, something that you should foster. And uh, actually, New York State and EO95 are pretty good. And uh, it's something that uh, uh, 
you should highlight and highlight opportunities there. We'd be happy to work with you on that. Uh, we just, in fact, spoke to ITS's uh, data management and open data team last week, so it's fresh in our mind. And then um, you mentioned open meeting law, uh, the, uh, and it, it's good that you're doing more research. There is a very, very active discussion underway already that uh, you are not in. Um, and that is uh, a discussion with disability groups, uh, watchdog groups like ourselves, and the governor's office. And uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, remote meetings and or hybrid meetings are going to happen, no matter what, how much moaning comes out of local government entities that you're talking to and um, compiling all of their endless complaints and frustrations, because there's massive political support for hybrid uh, remote open meetings. And um, it's very complicated, but we would definitely like to see KU in that discussion uh, on a technical level and not in your own separate loop. And um, we will happily, happily put you uh, in touch with the disability groups of which there are a lot and have a lot of resources and a lot of political power. Um, and this open meetings discussion is just gonna get more and more ripe. So uh, open meetings law and uh, hybrid uh, slash remote open meetings are gonna be one of the biggest things that we think is gonna burden you or, or you know, occupy you folks uh, coming forward. But again, um, uh, we really uh, would like to hear uh, more on that, and we'll happily uh, talk to you and put you in touch uh, offline. And uh, that's why you have us here today. So uh, to talk about things like that. Um, and by the way, something um, just uh, 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 on the use of the algorithms, uh, super robust discussion in New York City, New York City Council on this. And there are people on New York City Council staff with expertise that have collated enormous amount of expert stakeholder testimony on this. So uh, there, you can save yourselves a lot of time. Uh, there's been a, a tremendous amount of uh, pro-con debate and it's a very, very complicated issue, but uh, the city has many, many uh, sophisticated stakeholders who have uh, testified before council submitted testimony and are actively advocating. We're happy to help uh, put you in touch with them to help you save time. Um, the, Again, just on the honest assessment part, I mean, we understand that the coup uh, itself, the committee includes uh, mainly at this point uh, appointees from government and government agencies, and it's not going to be easy for you to criticize, uh, you know, your bosses or the legislature, as it were. But um, but uh, we, we really do have to underline here that what's in the coup annual report uh, is it just does not seem to quite capture the level of uh, dissatisfaction that is felt within uh, both transparency stakeholders, specifically groups like our own, and I'm sure you'll hear from Paul, but also uh, editorials on FOIL, uh, open meeting law, and um, and general press coverage uh, is, is very, very critical, and they're not wrong. Um, and that's not Coob's fault. But uh, but if you uh, if you could, it would help to be able to talk about uh, uh, how transparency uh, laws and the, the states will call it the official transparency philosophy that's that's expounded on in public officers is actually taking place. Uh, I think that would that would be a hugely useful grounding and um, uh, help move things along. Um, that. Uh, what are uh, what are you guys going to do? Again, we hope you have a meeting or a retreat or some kind of uh, session uh, with the public just on where you're going. And um, that it's too late to put that in this annual report. But uh, it's it's obvious that uh, Coog can't fulfill to us uh, the the huge. Uh, mandate that's already thrust upon you and the expectations uh, that uh, that are put towards you. I mean, there's the, the fact that the legislature believes that Coop staff has the capacity to actually do lots more work developing uh, policy recommendations on really complicated things 
uh, is uh, we don't think realistic at all, and we think you should be talking about that. Um, and um, again, volume, 300,000 at least oil requests a year. Uh, if we put a, a dollar value in each one of those requests and, and, and their total, you know, it's millions of dollars that uh, state and local governments are uh, spending responding to FOIL requests. And uh, yet there is no uh, real systemic effort to try to improve that system. And, um, and, and that is not Coop staff's fault. That is the fact because you guys are, are small. So um, the, uh, one of the things, uh, you know, is governor, uh, here's a letter we just sent to Coop out to the governor in June uh, uh, of this year from a bunch of groups saying, hey, uh, fill the vacancies on Coog, and um, which would be a good first step to, to help uh, giving you more folks and uh, making you more robust. So uh, we're, we're very aware of what Coog can and cannot do. Uh, and uh, we, we like to see a strong Coog. We support you. and. Um, and uh, this is a shocker for us. We work with the committee on in ethics and government a great deal. Uh, we were one of the groups that spearheaded the changes in ethics laws. Uh, the committee on uh, ethics, ethics commissions has 60, a head count of 68 that they're heading towards right now. The authority's budget office uh, has authorized 30, but they're probably gonna cap out at 25. And I think you have five. Um, we don't really know, but we'll say you have five, maybe you have four, uh, um, but we, we think you're around five full-time equivalents. The, the point is, is an obvious one. The transparency mandate, uh, and uh, Dave Schultz uh, rightly also pointed to the fact that, that who has an accountability mandate too. It's that government agencies follow the uh, transparency mandate. That requires more, uh, more forces than you have right now. Uh, five folks is not going to do it. So we would like to see you uh, uh, clearly break down uh, your mission and uh, establish what you think is an adequate headcount um, because uh, somebody needs to be inside government helping the agencies and um, serving as a public ombuds and, and champion so that these transparency principles and philosophy of the state are actually uh, implemented and, and work towards in a, in a much more uh, systemic, uh, timely, uh, and, and real way than they are now. I mean, we think, we think uh, transparency in New York is, is in a bad state, and uh, that's, um, uh, that's a frustration that's shared across many, many, many silos of uh, public advocacy and certainly within the state legislature um, itself. So who we want more for you. That should make you happy, I think. But um, you know, we think it'd be realistic to have a coup that was staffed at 25, uh, since we think your mission is equal to or greater than the authority's budget office. Which, by the way, I should add, uh, we we were instrumental in getting them the funding to get uh, their headcount up to 25, uh, because it had previously been at nine. So uh, we helped organize a big coalition, and we'd be happy to work with coup to help seek more funding. We think you have a great case to be made uh, to be bigger and that it would create efficiencies throughout government uh, and uh, help agencies because of your ability to disseminate best practices and uh, help them be better at doing their transparency job. Um, again, uh, ABO has five times more people. Uh, you are the only uh, body dedicated to state transparency laws and transparency within the state. The ABO uh, actually does a lot of the same functions as the state comptroller. We love the ABO. Again, we help them get more funding, but there is nobody but who. After you, there's no one. So uh, we think we think you need to be bigger and have more resources, and you should be talking about it and not afraid to talk about that, and that that's something that the committee members should be including in uh, the annual report uh, as part of the discussion. The um, specific to FOIL, uh, again, we've You've given the uh, committee and staff many, many dozens of recommendations. Uh, previously, they break down into four broad areas, uh, which is considering FOIL as an agency service and core function. Some of that is that having a bigger coup, um, vastly improved data collection for uh, the congressional mandate from the federal government. There's a bill to do that. 
uh, right now. Um, putting the FOIL process online, uh, we've been asking for that since 2010, and it's really good, and we applaud the, um, the GovQA contract that ITS has for $2.6 million with Granicus uh, for the GovQA FOIL processing software. We strongly support that uh, and um, hope you know, that goes very, very well. Uh, and then um, broadly, too, that's, that enables what's called release to one, release to all, or open FOIL, in which uh, uh, other members of the public can see the requests and, and responses to all uh, records requests that are not about oneself. So that anything one's requesting uh, uh, that is not a educational or criminal or health or anything about one's self as a person, we think should be released to one, released to all, which by the way, uh, the Port Authority of New York has been doing now for five or six years and there's dozens of examples across the country where it's already happening and um, we think the state could, could do it and that uh, the GovQA software looks like it can do that. Um, for 2023, uh, if we were just to see two things, uh, one would be uh, to uh, get rid of the substantially, the word substantially in the attorney fees law uh, so that it's just prevail uh, for foilers who are, are seeking their attorney's fees rather than substantially prevail. Uh, we uh, championed and fought for the attorney fees law for six or seven years as one of our top priorities. And uh, we're forced to accept the word substantially as part of the political compromise for passage. And uh, we strongly oppose that, but, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's unnecessarily complicated and confuses judges and has created a whole different test about the word substantially. It just should not exist. Uh, at all. And then um, again, on uh, GovQA, FOIL software, uh, we think uh, Coob should cheerlead for that, specifically mention it in the report as a good thing, and, um, and encourage its fast and expanded uptake, um, and just talk that up. This is really good, and it, and it has potential uh, for a virtuous cycle of things by agencies to increase their transparency, reduce delays to the public, and generally make FOIL more workable. And that's just, those you notice are two things. We're not giving you 20 things or 30 things uh, because uh, we, we, would, we think less is more from Coob on that. Um, on Coob's role in appeals, uh, we would point out, going back to that bar graph showing Coob's, uh, I don't know, five, five staff people, uh, that, uh, that you don't have a lot of people. And while we totally share the frustration that uh, many stakeholders have, with FOIL appeals uh, and what a pain it is to litigate Article 78 claims, uh, uh, we have to uh, say that that until Coob uh, gets a big budget boost, and we mean big, five to ten x headcount of what you have now, then um, then Coob could become a hindrance, not a help, in uh, uh, making FOIL work better because. Uh, we just don't see how you have the folks, uh, given the number of, uh, I, I believe uh, Kristen mentioned, 3,297 appeals were shared uh, with the committee uh, since the previous meeting. Uh, 3,297 appeals is a pretty big number, and uh, it would take a fair number of two staff, expert staff, to be able to make rulings on those and participate and evaluate that. So. It, it's a package. If you become part of the agency appeal process, uh, it has to be part of creating a much, much bigger coup. And uh, that means that the governor has to want it. And we would point to the fact that, that when the authority's budget office was created under the Public Authorities Reporting Act, uh, you know, more than 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that, um, that it called the legislation called for a headcount of roughly 30 people and it was only last year, so 15 years plus after its creation, that the ABO had the funding to have more than a dozen people. So even if the legislature puts in law that Coog uh, should have, uh, you know, whatever, be able to uh, do this mandate to have the, quote, adequate staff, it is not meaningful unless the governor agrees to put that in the budget and again, looking at the example of the ABO and the Public Authorities Act, uh, it took them a decade and it took 
outside stakeholders a long time to get that uh, staffing appropriation, which, by the way, is still below what the legislature uh, suggested uh, in, I think, 2009. So um, that's just a cautionary note on that, and uh, because we know that many uh, uh, transparency groups and FOIL stakeholders are excited about uh, COOP being part of the agency appeal process. That said, um, we don't think that that's going to advance because groups like uh, uh, NYCLU share this concern, which is why I'm citing it here. NYCLU is extremely important uh, to the um, uh, chances of any big change in FOIL or COOP's structure. So um, point made there. Um, again, we talked about OML. Uh, special thanks to COOP for the key advisor opinion that uh, that you issued in 2021, which we thought really helped during uh, when, uh, local governments and journalists were struggling to understand uh, what the heck the story was with uh, remote meeting mandates or uh, allowances. And um, very, very well done by Coop, which is why uh, we want you uh, in that discussion, uh, your staff and uh, that is uh, you know, going to be heating up right now instead of not selling it. Um, and then um, note at the bottom that, um, and this is a link, that we have eight components uh, that we think are needed for a successful hybrid OML process. And uh, we re uh, recommend that you take a look at those. Um, proactive disclosure, uh, you know, the, the broad laws that say that agencies should just proactively disclose everything, uh, we would love those. But in some ways, they're a fantasy because uh, when you ask for everything, you get nothing. And uh, we would like to see Ku just put out a couple things a year in the annual report uh, that you think or have heard from stakeholders or that the agencies think is easy. It doesn't matter, but there needs to be some nibbling away at proactive disclosure. Uh, and there's things like agency tables of organization, for instance, that are just so obviously should be on uh, agency websites. Why not, you know, do we have to put it in law? I guess so, but just some items that just should be, this should be on every agency site, um, makes sense. Uh, Interagency agreements from the last 10 years, uh, we were surprised that you can't find uh, interagency MOUs uh, and that those are something that involve a thorny foil process. That seems absurd. Uh, we're not talking about security arrangements or, or things that reveal, you know, software or potential harm to the public. Um, we're talking about basic agreements uh, for processes uh, between uh, different agencies at different levels of government. Um, and uh, that's it. Put that stuff online. Come on. Um, and then another one is just uh, machine readable, uh, putting tabular data online in a machine readable format uh, beginning you know, arbitrarily January 2024, uh, which is something, and that includes everything in reports. And that's something that the, the Division of Budgets, Open Budget New York, they put the entire budget, including every table in it, and that's 18,000 pages uh, online in a machine readable format for 10 years. So um, very confident that uh, at least uh, state agencies can do that. And it's something realistic why do we say that? Because this is a, a, a pain in the butt for watchdog groups, journalists, and legislative central staff, because uh, uh, agencies, and you know who you are, uh, put lots and lots of data online, call it transparency, and the reality is, is it requires intense work to scrape all of that to make it actually useful in the spreadsheet. So those are a couple of things. And then here's a little picture telling me that uh, we're at the end of the end of the road here. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. And, um, uh, you know, thoughts or questions uh, 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 or online, offline, whatever you want. Um, well, thank, thank you, John. Um, I'm sure that the, the group will have plenty of questions and or comments, but maybe maybe not this minute if they don't have it this minute. You've offered to be available, and we'll take you up on that for sure. We do have one more invited speaker presenter, and just being mindful of time, I'm, I'd like to maybe be able to transition to them, unless anyone has a burning question right now. Otherwise, we have your contact information, and we'll certainly be reaching out. 
I just want to be sure to, to thank separately. I, I think this was really, really useful. Um, I think as a committee, we should be thinking, I know I've been advocating since Sushana got here that we should have a, a retreat where we actually spend a day or two thinking about some of these issues. And there's clearly a lot of things we need to think about. So thank you for bringing all these to our attention. And I just want to be sure, did you say we would have access to those slides? Dave, we did I circulate them. I emailed them. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bring Paul on. Hey, Paul, I'm making you a panelist, and I'm unmuting you. So if you would like to turn on your camera, you're welcome to. I have to apologize. I have to make sure. Thank you. Uh, I'm just looking for my camera. I'm not used to WebEx. I usually do Zoom. It might be along the bottom. There's a little icon that you can click to activate your camera. I see the more options. I just don't see a camera. I'll start video. Here. Start start video. It maybe yeah, yeah, maybe say start. There we go. <laughs> uh, so my name is Paul Wolf. I serve as president of the New York Coalition for Open Government. And I should say, I should have asked, I just assumed I would be speaking by phone for three minutes. So uh, I would have dressed better. Uh, and, uh, now I'm glad that I have more than three minutes, but I'm not going to take a lot of time. I know it's late, so I'll just, I should be able to do this in five or six minutes. Um, so the New York Coalition for Open Government is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization uh, dedicated to transparency issues. Um, we focus primarily at the local level. Uh, Reinvent Albany does a lot uh, at the state level, a lot in Albany. Um, we've just started to, you know, try to get involved in the world of Albany as far as pushing various legislation. Uh, but we really spend a lot of our time looking at things at the village, town, city, county, planning board type level. Um, and we do several reports each year where we just randomly check. And I think one of the problems uh, here is that there really is no monitoring of compliance with the open meetings law or FOIL law. Uh, I think we're probably the only entity that on a regular basis will do spot checks. And what we do is, is we'll take a look at just random towns, towns that start with the letter S, you know, cities of a certain population um, and we try to spread them out throughout the state and we'll check are you posting your meeting documents are you posting meeting minutes we'll look at executive session motions um, and every report that we've done unfortunately the results have been terrible um, it's very rare uh, that we have a majority of the entities that we're looking at are in compliance so after doing this for a couple years, it's our opinion that there's a crisis in New York State as, as far as open government goes. The, the law in large scale ways is just not being followed. Um, and as John said, I liked his phrase, an alternate reality. It really does seem like there's kind of an alternate reality out there. Um, and, you know, we've documented it in our reports. So what I want to talk about today is just six ideas that we put together in the letter we sent you uh, of things that we think may help. Uh, first one being to amend the Constitution to add the right to open government. Uh, it's interesting to me that uh, a few states have that in their Constitution. New York does not. Um, our only recourse at this point is to, to litigate, to file lawsuits. And if that's the way this is going to go, then adding an open government right to the Constitution would up the ante. It would make it not only a statutory uh, lawsuit, but a constitutional lawsuit. Um, and again, if that's going to be our only recourse, then there's, you know we should provide the public the tools to address their grievances, because right now uh, they're not being addressed. So there has been legislation introduced in the legislature to do this. Um, recently, the legislature has done amendments, you know, regarding uh, equal rights and other and the environment, um, just as those constituent groups have advocated for it. 
we think it would be uh, helpful on uh, open government issues. And it would just simply be a sentence or two that is added to the Constitution. Uh, second item is attorney fees, which John addressed as well. New York makes it very hard to obtain attorney fees. And again, this is the only recourse people have. Um, a lot of states don't have this, you must substantially prevail. You just prevail. If you win, if you file a lawsuit and they turn over, you know, five pages, well, you should get attorney fees. You had to go to court. You had to litigate it. In New York, we play this whole game of, well, you got, you know, 49% of the documents you requested. Does that mean you substantially prevailed or not? It's really crazy. Um, and in addition to that substantially prevail hurdle, you have to also jump over the hurdle of whether the agency, you know, can make an argument that they did, you know, reasonably acted as best as they could. Um, we don't have that hoop in many other states. You go to court and when you should get your attorney fees, reasonable attorney fees. We understand the judge would have discretion to determine what those are. But one of the ways to address this large scale noncompliance is I think if we had a couple lawsuits where attorney fees were awarded, I think the word gets out and maybe people start paying attention. And it's unfortunate that that's the point where we're at, but I think that's the point where we're at. Um, so that we, our bill that we drafted passed the Senate, uh, which we were glad to see. And then hopefully we can make progress on it as the legislature reconvenes in January. Uh, our third issue is live streaming of meetings. We certainly support uh, in-person meetings being live streamed. Uh, we support hybrid meetings. Uh, it's just not that hard and complicated, I think, as many people make it out to be. And in the letter, I mentioned, you know, a couple small municipalities is just several hundred people that are doing it. It can be done. It's really not that expensive. Uh, it's not that difficult. We understand that there's broadband issues and internet issues in particular areas of the state. We would gladly support funding being available to assist, you know, local governments with doing this or provide training. Uh, we're all for uh, helping them do this. Um, two states have recently passed legislation to mandate live streaming. I think it's going to grow. Uh, as John said, I think the day is coming that people really uh, like this, want this. Uh, during the pandemic, it was great to see how many people were watching meetings. It just goes to show you that people are interested. But if you make it easy for them, uh, they want to know what's going on in their local community. But maybe they can't make it uh, to the meeting, uh, you know, to work reasons, family reasons, disability reasons. Um, so we support mandating live streaming of meetings. We understand there's going to be some transition and difficulty to do that, uh, but there is a bill in the legislature regarding that. Uh, fourth item, the biggest issue I think we have is the lack of enforcement with open government laws. Uh, in other states, there are penalties. New York is one of three states in the country where there is no penalty for violating the law. Other states impose fines. Some states you get criminal charges. Um, but we don't have any of that in New York. Other states have an independent body uh, in Connecticut and other states that will investigate. Uh, they'll decide, you know, appeals. Uh, in other states, the attorney general's office is very actively involved. You as a member of the public can file a complaint with the attorney general and they will investigate and, you know, make some directions and rulings. We don't have any of that in New York. In New York, your only recourse is good luck, go find a lawyer, and good luck that you might get attorney fees. So there's a great deal of frustration out there in the public of what can I do? Uh, my FOIL request is being ignored. My town board isn't complying with the open meetings law. What can I do? There's nowhere I can go. Uh, and we try to help with that. And the only way we've been able to make some headway, truthfully, is just media pressure and embarrassing people um, to do the right thing. And it shouldn't be this hard. Um, and as far as enforcement goes, as John mentioned, while I would love to see the Committee on Open Government have enforcement powers, I just don't think it's very realistic. I don't think there is a body that can handle the thousands and thousands of appeals that are out there. 
One mechanism that I think that would work is a hearing officer system, which we mentioned in our letter. It's very interesting to me how small claims assessment cases are done. And in the, you know, if you want to challenge your property assessment, you fill out a one page application, you pay a filing fee, and I think people would pay a filing fee of fifteen seventy five, perhaps even a hundred dollars. It's a lot cheaper than going to court. And the court administration appoints a hearing officer. I think there would be attorneys that would be interested in doing these cases or other folks trained in open government laws, pay them a hundred dollars a case. And in the small claims arena, you get a decision within 60 days. You know, I don't, I think the same system can be replicated to address oil complaints, open meeting law complaints. Otherwise, we have to make it easier for people to sue. We have to mandate attorney fees. Uh, perhaps the committee or some other entity can uh, have powers, but it's gonna take a lot of staff and funding. Um, our fifth option or issue is tracking FOIL requests. As John said, we have very little information about what's going on with FOIL in New York State. At the federal government level, it's very different. I think all we need to do is copy the federal statute. At the federal level, their agencies are required to track FOIL requests. They're required to do an annual report. And it would be great for the committee to get an annual report from state agencies. This is how many requests we've received. This is our average response time. This is how many we denied and the reasons we're denying them. We know nothing. So every time we try to push reform, we get pushback saying, well, all you have is anecdotal stories. And that's true. Um, so it was great to see that Governor Hochul uh, asked state agencies to do a transparency report, which is a good first step, a uh, transparency plan. But we now need to take the additional step of, well, how about we monitor compliance with those plans? Or how about we track statistics as part of those plans? It's being done at the federal level not being done at all at the state level. And we really have no good idea of what's happening and what we know what's working and what's not working. Um, so we think this should be legislation uh, to address that. And the final issue is training. Um, it's just shocking to me how much ignorance we get, we hear from local officials. When we say to them, look, you're not posting your meeting documents online. And this has been the law for over 10 years now. People say, I didn't know. I'm glad you told me. It's just amazing to me, the lack of knowledge, or I mean, maybe it isn't that lack of knowledge, I don't know, but at least that's what they claim uh, when they're called out on it. We mandate training you know, for people that are on planning boards, zoning boards, judges when they get elected go to judge school, school board members receive some training, but elected officials and clerks who process a lot of these, you know, town clerks, city clerks, they don't undergo any training that's required. Now, some will do training through, you know, association of counties and villages and conferences of mayors, and that's great when people seek that out, but there's a lot of people that don't seek it out, and um, we really need to address that. Uh, there should be some type, of, and other states have done this. You know, you're required to acknowledge that you read a copy of the open meetings law and the FOIL law. You're required to undergo some training. Um, so we would like to see that happen. And, and the, the final thing I wanna say is, as John mentioned, uh, we believe you should have far more resources than you do. Um, and I've never seen a push or a concerted effort asking for it as well. Um, it's a shame how woefully underfunded COG is and the resources, I mean, you know, certainly no governor has, you know, every governor proclaims that they're for transparency, but they certainly haven't shown it by committing resources to COG. And that's something, you know, the more resources you have, the better. I would like to see you guys, you know, be more proactive, more monitoring. And I, I understand you can't do it. You just don't have the staff and resources. Um, but. Um, and I think the committee should be restructured as well. I think there should be other appointees on the committee, perhaps a representative from the attorney general's office, the city controller's office. It would be great to see if there were some uh, open government advocates on the board as well. 
So I thank you for uh, allowing us the opportunity to put forth some of these ideas. Uh, your, your website is a tremendous resource. I go to it all the time. It's great to be able to read your opinions and uh, we're, we appreciate having you. I just wish you had uh, more resources and, and we're willing to support you getting that any way that we can. Thanks. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Paul and his organization uh, at the moment? Or I know that he is available uh, to all each of us um, offline as well. Anything right now? David, I think you're on mute. David. I apologize, no. David. There was some background noise, so I muted you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, David. I think you're off now. No, oh, you're muted. <laughs> now you can go. Is, is John still online, or did he leave? Um, I, I, I did have a question for him, that if he's still available. I do not see John, but I see Tom Speaker. I mean, oh, Tom. Yeah, yeah, okay. that would be fine. I just wanted to, okay. if, he, if, he, if they're still there. Yeah, I'm here. Hold on. <laughs> there's his, so, there's his words. Yeah, so, Tom. so the question is, the, the, we were shown a, a letter that was sent by a number of groups to the governor urging her to fill the vacancies on this board. A number of us have been urging her to do that since she assumed office years ago. Nothing has happened. I just was curious whether you got a response to that letter and what it, what it said if you did. Received, we have not received a response to that letter, no. Is, uh, is, there a is, is someone here from Anthony Delgado's office today? Not today. See, that's a problem, I think. Uh, you know, there seems to be a lack of, of interest in the executive office and what's going on here, which, which I think is a problem. Um, and I just, to the extent that, that um, reInvent Albany is, is lobbyists and, and is, can push some of these things, I would encourage you to follow up on the letter because I do think that the committee is handicapped by not having a, a full complement of public speaker, I think we all agree to that. I don't think anybody, you know, thinks it's better to be smaller. And whatever you guys can do to assist in, in getting attention at the in the executive office on this issue, that would be terrific. Paul's group also signed on to that letter, didn't didn't you, Paul? We did not. Oh, you did not. Oh. he wrote a separate letter. I think okay. he's written a couple of letters that were separate. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, I, I think that at this point we are sort of approaching, uh, you know, a critical time. So I'd like to ask if we have any people on the line who are looking to make a comment, um, not by way of being an invited speaker, but are just our public commenters. Anyone with a hand raised? If anyone wants to, if, okay, we do have two people right now that have their hands raised. So I'm just gonna, we're gonna, just as a heads up, the people that are participating in this separate public comment period will have three minutes to speak, um, pointing out that there's a distinction between the invited guests that we had earlier, which you of course notice, I'm sure that had a little bit longer uh, opportunity to speak. But uh, our uh, the first person I'm calling on right now is Anne Marie, and I'm going to unmute you now. Go right ahead. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Amory Reeb, and I'm also a member of the New York Coalition for Open Government, but I'd like to speak with you as a citizen, a taxpayer in the state of New York. Um, one, I'd like to thank Mr. Keeney regarding addressing transparency of public finance. That is a severe issue in this state where we can not get documents or they're not available per open meetings law where they're not posted online. If you cannot get your budget, you have no idea how your town is spending or your village spending your money. Uh, I'd also like to thank Paul for the information he has put out. A lot of those ring true for me, um, especially on the enforcement issue. There is no enforcement of anything in the state of New York. And I know because I have filed multiple complaints with multiple state agencies, and I'm still waiting for justice for our town. Our, our, the town uh, the town residents. 
Um, I'd like to address the governor, the GovQA that you've talked, that John Keeney brought up regarding um, how great this is. Uh, um, as a person who actually has utilized this, um, I'm still waiting. It's been 48 hours just for a response from Granicus because I can't get into the system. Um, I set up my account. I got approval and information to get into my account, and it's telling me my username is invalid. It's 48 hours with no response. There's nowhere, there's nowhere you can go to get information on how to utilize GovQA. So I think there needs to be a lot of tweaking of GovQA before this is expanded. Um, as far as live streaming, I'm sure you received the coalition's report on live streaming. Um, I was involved in that where I actually pulled data and vetted data. Uh, there was uh, a definite need for live stream um, during COVID and a lot of the towns, villages and cities, they utilize this live stream. And then when it went to um, after COVID, uh, town cities and villages just dropped this and their, their actual residents were um, in their minutes stating, why can't we still have this? I, I think that the one gentleman brought up about how you um, have to travel a distance to get to the meeting. That's important because in rural areas, there's no bus lines. If you don't have a vehicle, you cannot attend a meeting. It's not just about people with disabilities. It's also about our elderly students, those who don't drive, who have no access to transportation. Maybe it's an economic issue and they can't afford to do that. So I think it's very important you look at all aspects of these things that have been discussed before moving forward with anything so that you understand from the citizen's point of view who actually is very well aware of it. So thank you so much for your time. And I appreciate what the coalition, um, or I'm sorry, the Committee for Open Government does for us. But again, without you having enforcement capability. Thank you, Anne Marie. I'm sorry, just need to stop you now, okay? Thank yep. you, thank you for so much. Permit. Thank you. All right, and my next person I'm calling on is Michelle. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, yes, my name's Michelle. Um, I am the vice president of the coalition. Just to the Committee on Open Government in New York State does not need to reinvent the wheel to partner with entities that are already doing some of this. The comptroller is currently auditing um, open meeting law section 103-2E um, and issuing reports with compliance for open meeting law. So the resources are there and, and then also too, Paul spoke about Indiana. The Indiana Public Access Counselor is a entity of four. So again, offline reaching out with other state entities that have things like Connecticut, like Indiana, who are helping to formulate leading the national law, New York State should be included with that. Thank you so much for everything everyone does. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we don't have anyone with our hands up, so I think we are done with our public comment period. All right, thank you. Um, the only other thing on the agenda is uh, any uh, new business. And I have one thing, but I'm willing to wait to see if anyone else has something before I raise it. Um, the other thing is we're down to less than a quorum. Right. I, oh, okay. I just want to make sure to less than a quorum. Now so. we can no longer debate. So um, <laughs> I will just issue a general uh, instruction request. And that is a couple of months ago, I solicited information from each of the members of the committee concerning your county of residence and your biography if you are not an ex officio uh, designee. And um, so that's, uh, that's a couple of us. And I received information from some, but not from all. And in order for us to be in compliance with those new regulations, um, I'm gonna need from each of you, your county of residence and the bio that you'd like me to put on our website. And that's all I have. So please just send me those when you have them. Can I make one request too? I just would like to put out there a request that we, we think about the, the, the possibility of some sort of a larger retreat, or at least think about how it could be structured so that we could hold it when we're up to full speed um, and have everybody on board. Uh, I, I think there's a planning process that we should start, and I would just like to raise that as a 
an issue. Any retreat we had that we would discuss committee business would have to be an open meeting. So we'd have to stream the whole thing. Yeah, that, 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 that's fine, but I, I okay. think it behooves us to do it, right? So. Okay. Um, all right. Franklin, do you have something? I see you reaching. Not going to. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Um, unless anybody has any other new business or any other information they want to share, again, we are down to below a quorum, so we can't really debate or deliberate anything. Um, but I want to thank everyone, especially our invited speakers, for joining us today. and providing those pieces of information and, and uh, we'll be in touch, I think, either severally or all together um, to follow up. And um, so thank you. And unless I hear an objection, we'll adjourn now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, who, what is the, um, under what conditions is, is malfeasance? In an office, how is that handled? You mean like as a public officer? Yeah. Well, there are several statutes that address malfeasance. Yes. Um, 